Good morning and welcome to the program. I'm Jim Watkins, your host, and this is Talk Radio 990 KQSB. The program is South Coast Focus. Coming up this hour, we're going to talk to a gentleman who has spent some hard time in Russia. He is going to give us some insight into the political arena and what is happening in that country that is going through so many changes. Stephen Van Hook will be my guest later on in the show as we travel to Russia. But before we program, this is South Coast Focus on Talk Radio 990 KQSB. I'll be honest with you, at press time, because I've been uh, able to get away for a couple of days for my vacation, I actually have recorded this particular segment of the program before the final elections came through regarding Russia's election for their next president. And, of course, uh, all accounts taken, it looks as if, even at this time, Boris Yeltsin will be the winner. If for no other reason, he's got the press on his side. We all know the value of having the press on our side. And a couple of weeks ago, I struck a conversation up with a gentleman here in Santa Barbara by the name of Stephen Van Hook. Uh, he was sitting on the grand jury, and we were talking about politics in Santa Barbara. And then Stephen brought to my attention that uh, he had spent some time in Russia covering their political scene back in 1990 and 1991. Uh, he has worked in media and public relations for more than 15 years, including positions he has held in Washington and in Montana. Moscow. Uh, he has worked with a number of American and Western clients in the former Soviet Union, including CBS, BBC, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, Transcom com, uh, com, Communications, the Boris Yeltsin. It says here you've covered Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin, so I imagine that was your assignment at one time, right, Mr. Van Hook? Yeah, I was uh, producing news coverage at the time for BBC and CBS, and uh, Boris Yeltsin had just been elected president of Russia, which was still kind of a vassal state of the uh, Soviet Union at that time. So mm -hmm. he was kind of a secondary figure, but uh, nonetheless, you, you saw the seeds of his... Uh, his drive for power. I remember very distinctly when Yeltsin was uh, coming up the ranks. The, personally, I, I felt a little bit of apprehension. I was a big fan of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. I enjoyed his book, uh, Perestroika, and I thought that he had a lot of insight. And he is not a, a very popular person right now in Russia, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But for those who, who listen to this show on a regular basis, we talk about the issues and events that go on in our everyday life, uh, some that take place in this city and some that take place as far away as Russia. And we're talking about how things affect us here at home. Uh, for better or for worse, and certainly what is going on in Russia, even though it may not have a direct effect on, say, what movie I'm going to see tonight or or, or what my uh, prices will be on vegetables uh, this week, certainly what we're seeing in Russia with the, the elections and, and certainly them trying to come up with a comprehensive idea for a direction for their country, that does kind of have an effect, uh, certainly on our politics, certainly on uh, our relationship with Russia and where they decide to go. Uh, on an international level, they do have an effect on us. Isn't that correct, Mr. Ho uh, Van Hook? Oh, sure, you bet. And frankly, I, I see the questions that the Russians are facing right now not so different than the questions that we're facing right here in the United States. Uh, the growing schism between the rich and the poor, uh, the ominous and, and widespread corruption within their government ranks. Uh, uh, older people now being hit the hardest of all as a segment of their society. Uh, just basic questions of whether you're going to have state control or private control over uh, various economic means of production. and These are the very same kinds of questions, I think, to a greater uh, degree, certainly in Russia, but we're facing these very same questions now in the United States. and. Uh, uh, they're kind of paving the way for us in a lot of these issues, I believe. Well, let's talk about your experiences there. For those of us who, who, who have this idea of, of Russia, we always think of it as being this cold... Um, matter of fact, a lot of people probably think of Siberia as being Russia, but obviously down by the Caspian Sea and areas of the southern part of the, the country, it's probably very spectacular and beautiful, and we don't often think of anything other than long food lines and everything. But you, you were there, so... So give us an inside look into the day-to-day uh, -day life of an average Russian. Well, the thing that struck me first and foremost about the Russians is the premium they put on relationships. I mean, that is their medium. That's their currency in their country. Uh, 
uh, they certainly don't have the economic base that we have here in the United States. So their source of interacting with one another, their economic foundation is their relationships with their families and their friends. If they need something, uh, uh, it's not quite as much so today, but certainly in the past, if they needed something, they went to their friends and their connections. You couldn't go to the corner hardware store. So they put such a premium on their friendships. Russians are so difficult to make a friend out of, especially as American. They tend to be quite suspicious of you. But once you've made a friend of a Russian, boy, they are friends for life, and there's very little they wouldn't do for you. And I think that's the thing that struck me as the most profound. And certainly coming back to the United States after spending a year in Russia, it struck me the superficiality of our relationships, even within our family. You know, mm -hmm. certainly we care about one another, but nowhere near to the degree that I saw in the Russians. And in some ways, they strike me as a much richer people because of that. There is a lot of emphasis put on uh, family connectedness. For instance, uh, I'm just guessing, maybe perhaps because of the economic reality, but uh, generally speaking, families do still live together. They don't uh, send their kids off as often as, as say, we are prone to do or, or have our, our grandparents put in a home when they get to an age. There is more of a cohesiveness in their family. Sure, structure. and again, a lot of that simply through economic necessity. You'll see three generations living in a single two-bedroom apartment with sheets down the middle of the living room, uh, providing what little privacy it might. I've seen families where the husband and the wife have been divorced for 10 years, still living in the same apartment, each one of them with a new relationship, <laughs> simply through the economic necessity where they can't get a new place to live, still living with one another. It, uh, it boggles the mind. We're talking with Stephen Van Hook, who has been in Russia, who has lived there as a journalist and has been a part of their, their uh, culture uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, Mr. Van Hook, what, what happened? What went wrong with the communist state there, in your opinion? Why did it break down? Well, it simply imploded, I think, is, is the philosophy and the theory that uh, you see in most of the pundits these days. Of course, there's a lot of politicians who would like to claim uh, credit for it, that uh, we simply raised the stakes to so high a degree that they simply couldn't compete. Uh, kind of the Reagan theory of raising the stakes in the Cold War, that uh, we bankrupted them. But there was a whole lot more going on to that uh, politically, economically, uh, even spiritually. The Russians simply, or the Soviets, simply ran out of steam and imploded upon themselves. Are they an atheist culture? Oh, uh, I, I think religion may have been suppressed for a number of years, but what it did was it bubbled up in these most passionate forms of expression, the people that still maintain the religion, the old women in Russia, the babushkas that would teach their, their children and their grandchildren, you know, the, the most profound spiritual beliefs. And I think it made it all the more special. It's just like Russian literature and their poetry is just so emotive and so passionate and so strong because it bubbled up in this most suppressive atmosphere. And uh, you look at what's happening with the religious re resurgence today. The, the church is spreading in ways that uh, certainly, <laughs> I think, put it to shame in our country as far as the moral foundation of our religious, uh, our religious leaders. Uh, in a moment, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Boris Yeltsin. I know that uh, off microphone, you and I have had some some rather humorous conversation about uh, our perceptions of him and how we tend to think of uh, Boris certainly as being a, a drunk, a womanizer. But <laughs> I think you mentioned that uh, those are not attributes that uh, people in Russia necessarily look down upon. When we continue, we'll continue this discussion. Stephen Van Hook is my guest this half hour on Talk Radio 990. The name of the program is South Coast Focus, and we'll continue in just a moment. Stay tuned. This is the biggest and best oldies collection on Compact Disc. Welcome back to the program. South Coast Focus continues. My guest, Stephen Van Hook, who is a journalist who has spent some hard time in Russia. First of all, Stephen, uh, you volunteered for this uh, this time. You actually pursued the uh, the the, uh, the journalism opportunities to be found there. That is not something a lot of people would have done back in 1990. What made you do that? Well, it was uh, somewhat serendipity. I had studied Russian as my, uh, my language in college, and an opening came up. I was working as a, as a bureau chief and uh, news, news director and uh, anchor up in uh, Oregon, and an opening came up for a new bureau uh, in, in Russia, a television bureau, and simply based on the fact that I'd studied Russian some five years earlier in college, I, I, I got the job. So, And this was before... Uh, 
certainly the big schism between uh, uh, Gorbachev and, and, and the more reformist forces. Uh, so just through serendipity, I happened to wind up in Russia at a very uh, interesting and profound time of, of change there. Uh, I did interview uh, Yeltsin just shortly after he was uh, elected as president of Russia, and, and basically I, I was struck the same way you mentioned earlier. Uh, this man did not strike me as especially intelligent, as especially diplomatic, and indeed he quickly proved himself to be somewhat the buffoon that he struck me as. And I was just flabbergasted that the Russians seemed to put this man to such a higher degree than they did Gorbachev, who I think history is going to show is one of the most profound reformers of the 20th and probably even the 21st century. I mean, this is a man who changed the face of the world. and I just could not understand why the Russians felt such a greater affinity with Yeltsin. And basically, I think it was because Yeltsin was a drinker. Yeltsin was a womanizer. Yeltsin was loud and brash, as we've seen over the tenure of his presidency. And I think the Russians felt like, well, here's a man of the people. Here's somebody we can relate to. Here's somebody who's one of us. He's not the intellectual functionary that I think Gorbachev was perceived as among his own people. Well, when they had the elections uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was, what, June 10th or something like that, uh, and of course it was neck and neck between uh, his challenger, the Communist Party challenger, Gennady Zyuganov, and right. uh, it was so close. About uh, a three percentage point. Uh, w which yeah. just goes to prove that every vote counts, which we in this country sometimes tend to forget, but uh, and, and Yeltsin, of course, had a big fight ahead of him. He had, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he had uh, one of the key things, I think, was he had the media on his side. Uh, here they are now doing a runoff election, and Yeltsin seemed to slip back into some sort of uh, vagueness, uh, and, and I'm sure that you're probably watching thinking, oh no, he, he's back on the bottle. I mean, uh, and of course the word now is always has helped uh, maybe a, more of a challenge than actually getting the country back uh, where, where it needs to go. Are you concerned that uh, Yeltsin uh, will will lose his grip on uh, perhaps his alcohol problem? <laughs> well, I, I don't think he's ever really had a grip on his alcohol problem. This is a man who kept uh, the Prime Minister of Ireland waiting outside of a plane because he was too drunk to work his way down the steps. This is a man who his first visit to the United States was so drunk that uh, when he got off the airplane at National Airport, the first thing he did was relieve himself on the tarmac. <laughs> I mean, this isn't a way to run a country, is it? Oh, well, this is a man that evidently resonates somehow with the Russian people. What I see this election as, and also keep in mind, I mean, the, the Russian men, uh, to a degree, I think, unsurpassed in the world, tend to love their drinks. So this is something they can really relate to in, uh, in, in Boris Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it works against him necessarily in that regard at least not uh, on the scale that's going to keep her from getting elected. But I think this current election is not so much a choice between personalities, the personality of Yeltsin versus the personality of Zyuganov. I think it's a referendum on which direction do they want to see the country go. And that's not necessarily represented in the body of Yeltsin as much as it is in the men that he surrounded himself right now. Uh, his, his prime minister, uh, Chernobyl Meriden, uh, Labid, uh, who was also very uh, strong, he did very strongly in the in the election on the 16th. He took some 15% of the vote. Hold, on, hold that thought just a moment. It's uh, 11.30, and we do have to take a quick break for CNN Radio News. Stephen Van Hook, my guest, we're talking about Russia and what is going on over there. South Coast Focus continues in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. South Coast Focus continues. I'm Jim Watkins, your host. We are talking with Stephen Van Hook. Van Hook is an award-winning public speaker and writer. He has produced numerous documentaries, special reports, public affairs programs. He is a frequent writer for American newspapers and magazines on the development in Russia. We were talking just a moment ago before CNN Radio News about Boris Yeltsin who have, for all intents and purposes, as I mentioned also, that we're recording this interview before the elections have been finalized, but everybody seems to be saying the same thing. Yeltsin will probably win. And uh, let's just assume for the most part that he did. And now he is uh, back in the presidential seat that he never left. He was the incumbent of Russia, which, of course, is going through some dramatic changes, both politically and economically. And I interrupted you, uh, Mr. Van Hook 
talking about uh, Boris Yeltsin and who he has surrounded himself with. And you brought up a key point, and I want to talk a little bit about this. If you've got a man who is running Russia, and he is inebriated, uh, what does that say, and what about the circle of influence around him? Are there people who perhaps want him to be that way so that they can kind of run the country themselves? Are we looking at that? Is that, is that a possibility? Well, I think we saw that in some degree with Brezhnev when he was uh, general secretary, that he was basically a puppet for the people behind the, the man that were pulling the strings. And uh, we've, we've heard it said before that a president's job or a leader's job isn't so much to lead the country as it is to draw attention away from those people who actually do yeah. run the country. Uh, and again, I don't think Yeltsin, and, and frankly, you know, Yeltsin has had two heart, heart attacks now within the last six months. The average lifespan of your typical Russian male is uh, 58 years old and dropping, and Yeltsin has already exceeded that by uh, close to uh, close to a decade. So I, I don't think he is going to be the figure we're going to be dealing with on into the new millennium. Uh, okay, so introduce us to whoever is going to replace him, if we can assume the worst that Boris Yeltsin will somehow become incapacitated to continue his role as president. Who would be his replacement? Well, we're, uh, Yeltsin has basically named his successor as uh, General Levitt, who is a very strong nationalist figure who is condemning Western influence, specifically United States influence coming in and taking over uh, the, the, the Russian culture, the Russian heritage. And frankly, he's got a point. I mean, you're seeing uh, Pizza Hut and McDonald's and uh, Taco Bell and Mm-hmm. And, and, and basically, I wouldn't say the worst that America has to offer, but certainly it, it, it undermines the great Russian culture that uh, uh, these people are so proud of. And we have to be very wary of that because the backlash can be very strong, as we've already seen in, in Lebanon, some of the comments he's made over the last several weeks. So. Mm-hmm. Well, well to tell me a little bit about what the average uh, person does every day. I mean, do they spend a lot of time in front of the TV, or do they go out and uh, walk their dogs? Uh, do they enjoy going out for Friday night? Uh, obviously, they, they have, uh, at least the younger the younger folks there, they have an affinity for, for rock and roll music, and the, the older folks are more traditionally bound. This is just based on what information I've received, or, or for that matter, most of Americans, how we think of Russians. But what do they do on a, on a day-to-day basis? Most of them are unemployed. Uh, most of them, uh, you give me an idea of what they're doing. Well, you've got 5 to 10 percent of the Russians right now, which are doing very well off of the Russian reform. And a lot of them were forming as car- uh uh, from your Communist Party members that uh, have reaped the rewards of privatization. So these communists are now suddenly capitalists and uh, making fairly good money. But then you've got the vast majority of the Russians, especially off in the hinterlands, which are basically living like they've always lived, which is struggling day to day to eke out a living on less than, I think the national average right now is under $200 a month that these people are trying to survive on raising their families. And it is not very easy at all. And again, it brings us back to the point I think the Russians are facing many of the same issues that we're facing here in the United States. They're looking for good leaders, good laws, economic opportunity, safety in their streets, peace of mind in their homes. And whoever gets elected, whether it's the Communist Party in Zyuganov or Yeltsin, or if Yeltsin doesn't make it in Lebed or Chernomirdin assume power, they're going to have these basic same kinds of issues to deal with. And, and frankly, if there were easy answers, we'd have those answers here in the United States, and, and we'd be implementing them here. There was a report by ABC News last week. Uh, it Basically, the caption could have been, who's running the military store? Uh, and there's been, I guess, some indication that perhaps in a worst-case scenario, we could find with the military leaders and their allegiance uh, a possibility of a civil war because no one will be pleased with the outcome of the elections. Is that a potentiality? Uh, I, I don't see it so much as a potentiality as a political maneuver. The Russians are easily scared. They've lived through their revolutions, and they don't want to go through that again. So I think it's an easy tactic, just like we do here politically in the United States. We throw out uh, these fearsome crime statistics, which actually, if you saw, I think the report just last night, uh, crime statistics in California and certainly in the United States are dropping to their lowest levels. But Since 1970, it's, yeah. It, it's an easy political ploy to try to put fear. It's much easier to scare people than it is to inspire them. We see it here in the United States. We see the same thing happening in Russia. I don't think that is, is the overwhelming fear at this point. Uh, I think more what we need to be afraid of is their sense of nationalism 
uh, surfacing that if they get too far devastated economically and socially and and and, and spiritually that it's, we're going to see a backlash in, in devastating ways same thing we saw in nazi germany when uh, uh economically they were just devastated and their sense of national identity and pride was demolished suddenly you saw this resurgence of nationalism and uh <laughs> unfortunately manifested itself in a very ugly way. I think we could possibly see the same thing happening in Russia. In fact, we do right now with this new anti-Semitism, uh, trying to find the scapegoat, and, right. and a kind of an anti-American spirit beginning to well up. Uh, so, uh, Stephen Van Hook joining me on this program with Talk Radio 990. Stephen Van Hook, a journalist who has spent some years in Russia. Uh, Stephen, your your feeling is that they probably will not step back into uh, communism. Are you are you pretty much sure that that uh, there was a, a recent Time magazine poll that showed uh, of stability or or capitalism or or free market most uh, seem to favor stability at at any cost. Uh, does that preclude the idea that they may be willing to go back to communism? I, I, I have a hard time. I have a hard time, I guess, with the various labels: communism, capitalism. Uh, you're just dealing with theories at that point. Basically, it's the same people that are running the show. It's the same people that are controlling the means of production right now. Is controlled it back when. Russia was a communist state. I, I don't think it's the political or the or the economic system so much as it is just basic issues that they want to have addressed. They want to have safety issues addressed. They want to have economic stability. Uh, they want a sense of uh, basic. They basically want the same thing anybody would want: uh, sure. health care available when they need it, sure. jobs available when they need them, uh, a regulation of some sort. Uh, and what are we going to call that? Are we going to call that a capitalist society, a socialist society, a communist society? Uh, uh -huh. uh, these labels, uh, I, I think, are kind of falling by the wayside. Sure, and it, and it, in fact, we've all been uh, told of this supposed evil empire uh, that existed one time, particularly during the Ronald Reagan, Mikhail Gorbachev era. Sure. And, and it almost reeks of uh, Orwellian uh, philosophy when we are at war with Eurasia, but now we are no longer at war with her. They've always been our friends, and there does seem to be that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the outreach of, uh, of the former communist uh, Soviet Union. Is communism as we know it failing in terms, for instance, what comes to mind is Fidel Castro, who for 20, 30 years had the, the alliance of uh, the former Soviet Union, yet he still reigns power in uh, Cuba and for who knows how long. Well, until he dies anyway. <laughs> right. Uh, and then, of course, we've got uh, communist China. And again, I, I hate to use the labels because I, I think they tend to simplify very complex issues. But uh, it does seem that Russia has taken a great step from being a communist state to being more democratic. Certainly not an easy step. The wheels of evolutionary politics seem to turn very slowly. Are they ready for uh, what we would term as an open society? Are they ready for that? Well, they certainly don't have it yet. I mean, Yeltsin, who uh, certainly professes to be one of the strongest democratic forces in, in Russia right now, still maintains very strong control over the news media. How can you have a democratic society without the free exchange of ideas? Uh, their state television still under control of the government. Their, their major newspapers still under control of the state government. So they have a long ways to go before you can even say that they're a rudimentary democratic state. But, but keep in mind, this is the first, well, actually the second now presidential election. And actually, uh, sir, uh, people that were there uh, monitoring the election process, so it was very clean. So they're beginning to get the, the feel of it now that uh, you can actually go cast your votes. They had 75% turnout. When was the last time we had 75% turnout in an American election? Uh, probably not since we were deciding whether we wanted to have gambling in, a, in, in the United States or something. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Stephen Badhook, my guest on this program. This is Talk Radio 990 KQSB. South Coast Focus will continue in just a moment. For more now for the new CBR. Welcome back to the program. Talk Radio 990 and South Coast Focus continues. My guest, Stephen Van Hook, a journalist in America, who, by the way, uh, was on the uh, county grand jury, which we cannot talk about. But one of these days, Stephen, I'm going to get you on that one. <laughs> uh, what, what is the... I'm curious 
I think I'm even more curious about uh, just the people. Uh, of course, the politics interests me, and, and I'm curious to find out the direction that they take politically. And, but I'm, I'm real curious. How are the women treated over there? Uh, what's the hierarchy? Is it, uh, is it predominantly male or women kind of looked at as being equal, not equal, more than equal? What, what's, the, uh, what's the structure over there as far as the relationships go between men and women? Well, like everything in Russia, it's such an extreme paradox. Uh, you have the old women in the society, which are bas basically the moral voice of the country, the babushkas, the grandmothers that are responsible for raising the families and, and uh, passing on their heritage and their knowledge. But then you also have the reality of the situation. I did a documentary on the life of Russian women for Fox Television, uh, including an interview with Raisa Gorbachev talking about the state of women over there. If you recall, Raisa Gorbachev was very much held in disdain because she had the gall to assert her own opinions mm -hmm. as a woman in Russia on where the country should be going, which was just taboo. Women aren't supposed to uh, be strong and speak their own opinions, especially uh, standing next to their husbands. Mm -hmm. Over there, the women have the hardest kind of life. They're responsible for maintaining the household, raising the children, going out and working just as hard as men, typically at the lowest paid and the hardest labor kind of jobs, coming home again Again, keeping the house, cooking the dinner, then putting up with a drunken and abusive husband. Mm -hmm. And this is just time after time after time I saw these kind of relationships going on over there. And I would talk with Russian women and uh, ask them, how do you endure this? And their attitude was basically, who are you Americans to come in here and tell us, a country that is centuries and centuries old, how we should live and interact with one another? They're just so far bought into this lifestyle over there that I think that's going to be one of the most difficult things to change in the Russian society is the relationship between the Russian men and the, and the Russian women, simply because it is so deep and possibly even genetic. Mm -hmm. uh, how are the teenagers there? I mean, they, they're in my opinion, they stand in danger of, of receiving or being exposed to all the gratifications of, of uh, say, American or Western life, uh, the music and the styles and sure. the fashions and everything. Right. But the, TV now airing on uh, Russian television. Oh, my goodness. Santa Barbara, the soap opera now, one of the most popular shows on Russian television. Yeah. Uh, what, are they, what are they going to do? You, do you foresee them taking hold of this Western-style uh, life uh, and, and seizing it and making it what their objective is or do you see them wanting to leave their country uh, to come here to pursue it or do you see them staying there and becoming stalwart and, and true leaders of the next generation? Well, that's got to be one of the most heartbreaking things that I, I had to go through as an American over there is these, these younger people and certainly the younger women looking for a way to get out of the country. And, of course, you know, the, the future of a country always rests with its children. And, 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 and when you see that as their main aspiration is to find a way to get out of their country, get into a Western company and somehow... Uh, either find their way into Europe or, or the United States to be their number one priority, their number one goal in life, that really uh, that breaks your heart. And, and, and to think that there's a possibility that they might somehow lose their foundation of this rich, rich heritage, that's, uh, that's a very disconcerting thought. You know, there, I, I was living up north, uh, and there was an exchange going on between uh, the city I was living in, Vladivostok, which was the Russian sister city to Juneau, Alaska, where I lived for a couple of years. And they had an exchange program going on where there, I think there was about 13 or 14 uh, students that were they were able to live in, in Alaska, which probably, for all intents and purposes, was very similar, at least uh, uh, scenery-wise, for where they came from. And uh, there was, uh, in interviewing some of the students there, they were just overwhelmed with the amount of goodies to be found, oh, yeah. uh, whether it be information or knowledge. But, but the general feeling that I had was that they were a very, very proud people. And, they, uh, and even though they enjoyed some of the Western lifestyle and some of the, I guess, the opportunities. Uh, my feeling was that they were more interested in going back uh, and trying to improve their country because of their strong patriotism. Well, 
and I, I hope that's certainly indicative of what's happening with young people across Russia. Of course, you realize Vladivostok is kind of off into a world of its own. Oh, yeah. They're on the east of Russia, very far removed, uh, uh, some 10 time zones away from what's happening in Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's probably what we're going to see is, is, is we evolve over the next decade or so that Russia is certainly going to become much more regionalized than it is now, more decentralized from the center of Moscow control, uh, you're going to see Siberia, Vladivostok, which is very rich in natural resources. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars worth of national resources, natural resources that have yet to be tapped in Russia. It's oil reserves, it's mm -hmm. timber, it's gold, it's diamonds. That uh, Once these Russians figure out how to access that and how to trade it on the world market, uh, I think we're going to see an economic powerhouse. At what point, at what point, uh, Stephen, do you do you feel, and even even if it becomes a reality, do you feel that it would would section up and that there would become regional areas that would be uh, sovereign to their own uh, internal affairs? Do you see that happening? And would it be in the best interest of uh, Moscow? I think economically it's already happening. Uh, you have uh, large, vast companies dealing in national, uh, natural, national and natural resources, oil and, and timber, basically funding their nose of Moscow's rule. The, the country is in such disorder right now politically that uh, these, these organs of control have very little impact on what's happening out here in the regions. And I don't see any means to try to bring that control back to center, at least in the near future. So I think economically, I also had a, a businessman tell me, uh, I, I did a recent series of seminars in Russia, he's actually very happy to see Yeltsin held in such disregard and, and as, as, as such a witness to how weak the government is in Russia. He says, because that's what that demonstrates, is how strong the business reforms are, that the, the reforms taking place in Russia can't be attributed to government controls, because look who we have leading our government. Mm -hmm. What's going to be Russia's resurrection and salvation is its business development, and that's going to have to happen on a regional basis. Mm -hmm. We're going to take another quick break. Stephen Van Hook joining me this morning. We're talking about Russia, its future, and its present state when South Coast Focus continues. This is Talk Radio 990 KQSB. Back to the program. Stephen Van Hook joining me for a very interesting and insightful look at Russia, its current state. Stephen uh, served uh, back in 1991 and in various capacities, but mainly journalism. He has done much research and has actually lived in that country, so he knows whereof he speaks. Uh, Stephen, final question, because we are running out of time. What is the one thing in your mind uh, you feel that Americans need or should know about Russians? I think what we Americans need to realize about the Russians, and indeed about all people everywhere, is they're really not so different than than we are. Uh, we, we tend to be very provincial in the United States and have very little knowledge of what's happening elsewhere in the world. But what you see happening in Russia, the decisions that they're making right now are basically the exact same decisions that we're making here at home. And, and what is it the Russians are saying in their, in their election right now? And, and as you see these Russians beginning to look back nostalgically at communism, what are they saying? Are they saying that we want dictatorship, that we want another Stalin, that we want these sufferings and purges that we've lived through. No, that's not what they're saying at all. What they're saying is is something else that, that we Americans should easily understand. They're saying no to foreign invasion and, and in other countries coming in and trying to take over their lands. We can certainly relate to that. They're saying no to crime. They're tired of mafia control. They're tired of being afraid to walk the streets at night. They're saying no to a growing schism between the rich and the poor and their older people that are suffering and and not even being able to find something to eat for that evening. I mean, these are the very same kinds of echoes that we hear in our own land, uh, our own homeland. And I think that's something we as Americans need to realize is, is, is as odd as these Russians might seem, that they're basically not any different than, than we are. It does seem that, in, in just in what you've said in the last few moments, that whereas 40 years ago we saw ourselves being completely uh, opposed or uh, opposite of, uh, of the Russian person, it does seem that we could almost draw many correlations to the, our similarities. Well, and I think we have to be aware of painting the world in colors of black and white, and, and we are the embodiment of all that's good and angelic, and the Russians are the embodiment of everything that is black and evil, as certainly yeah. we, we've seen it painted in the past, that uh, basically we're all just people trying to find our ways in the world. 
Stephen Van Hook, I want to thank you for joining me, and uh, we look forward to talking to you in the future. I understand you're trying to get back there? I've got a number of uh, business opportunities. We should see how stable Russia becomes after the election, and uh, hopefully American business and uh, investors will feel much more comfortable about that. Uh, heading on in there. Well, we we'll look forward to uh, keeping tabs on your progress, and if you do get back over there, I would uh, hope that you would give me a call, give me your mailing address. I'd love to correspond with you. Well, and I hope to get you over there as a journalist covering these uh, great changes someplace. Certainly, I, I don't think there's any more interesting place in the world right now. Uh, I, I tend to agree. Yeah, and uh, that would be a welcomed opportunity, I think. All right, uh, Stephen Van Hook joining me on South Coast Focus. We'll be back with some final thoughts. This is Talk Radio 990 KQSB. Stay tuned. South Coast Focus continues.